Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Gray Fox Latin Teacher Podcast. My name is Costas, and I'm here again today, as always, with Andrew. Hello, Andrew. It is great to be with you, Costas. Yes, and today is actually going to be a very interesting episode, I think. We have a bit more serious topic that we want to discuss. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about teaching Latin to students with learning differences. And I can just say uh, right from the jump that this is something that I do not have much, if any, experience in. Uh, So I'm really looking forward to learning what we're going to talk about today uh, during the show. Uh, Andrew, what sort of experience do you have in this? Well, I don't have an enormous amount of experience with this beyond the fact that, you know, clearly I've had a lot of different students and different students have uh, had different issues. You know, also individual students have uh, been better than other students at certain things, even though they might not be as good at certain things. Um, So, you know, I've had the normal experience, but I would say that our guest today Uh, has uh, a whole lot more experience than either of us, and I am looking forward to learning a lot. Yes, and it's also a very special day for the reason you just mentioned. We have on the show today our first of what we hope to be many guests, uh, and you just made mention of our esteemed guest today. She is an administrative associate who works with us at Gray Fox Tutors. Um, She has gotten her master's degree from the University of Virginia, her bachelor's from Williams College, and has worked as a Latin teacher at a number of different schools, including the Wheeler School and the Academy Hill School. Would you please welcome Lydia Hale Fassett. Lydia. Hi. (laughs) Wonderful to be with you today. How are you? Doing well. Great. So uh, as Andrew and I were talking about in the intro here, this is something that we don't have a whole lot of experience dealing with, but I know that you have some experience in this. Could you tell everyone um, sort of what your background is dealing with some of the topic that we're going to be talking about? All right. So a lot of my background is more on the practical side than the theoretical side. Um, Academy Hill School was a school for gifted students, and there were a lot of twice exceptional students there who had both a learning difference and were gifted. And then at the Wheeler School, there were actually two different middle schools, one which um, focused on students with learning differences, many of them specifically language differences, and one focusing on on students without um, major learning differences. And then students from both of those middle schools, went both uh, all of them went into the same upper school, which was where I was teaching. So okay, so, I, uh, mm-hmm. you know, before we go on, you're mentioning some terms, and I'd really like to sort those out. So you, you talked about learning differences, and you also talked about gifted. What's mm-hmm. the difference between learning differences and gifted? Well, um, people like arguing and discussing that one a great deal. So, and let's see. So gifted, those are usually students who are academically exceptional in some way. That's probably a good working definition here, although there are some technical differences I don't want to get into right now. And then students with learning differences, um, a lot of those are what in the past have been called um, learning disabilities, um, possibly things like ADHD or um, some pro- or problems with uh, reading or auditory processing or other things that can have a negative impact on their educational experience. Mm. Although in some in some ways, though, um, if you look at these differently, then sometimes they can really enhance and bring some really cool and interesting different ways of looking at things to the educational experience. So it's right. a balance right. so, there. You mm-hmm. know, for both students and teachers, they certainly can make things interesting. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, maybe sometimes frustrating, but maybe – You know, also, it's an opportunity for teachers to really uh, flex their muscles, to really learn how to be really great teachers. I know that it's only because I had students who weren't able to learn maybe as effectively as I wanted them to Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, with the method of teaching I might have been using that I learned, hey, there are other directions to go. There are other things that can be done. Um, But uh, I thought it would be great Mm -hmm. if we could maybe sort of talk about um, these individual categories. So you talked about uh, gifted students. You Mm -hmm. talked about uh, learning differences and then how there are subcategories among learning differences. Well, it's a plural word, so you would assume there are. Mm -hmm. Um, The first first category is gifted. So these are students who maybe have an easier time learning things. Is that right? Well, May I just it, interject a, one thing really yeah. quickly? Just, mm-hmm. uh, my fourth grade teacher had a wonderful poster she used to hang up in the back yeah. of her classroom that said, all children are gifted. Some just yeah. open their packages sooner than others. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there. So. Yeah. Right. Well, because actually, so there are different types of being gifted. So for example, I w- when I was teaching at Academy Hill, I was teaching students in fourth grade through eighth grade. And there'd be some students who'd be in fifth grade and working on high school math because they were just exceptional at math. But then they were at grade level or even below in um, literacy classes because just it was they tended to be very they had one area of great strength there. Other students um, will be more universe, uniformly strong across a variety of topics. Um, and then there are students who are more gifted in things like emotional intelligence and things like that. But so for the purpose of this, we're talking about mainly the academically gifted students. And they're, they're gifted it's often used as sort of a catch-all, but there are some students who it's, okay, you are very gifted in looking at structures and seeing patterns, and that can be wonderful to have in the Latin class. And then other students may be very gifted at being able to pick up um, the sounds and details of a language, or they may be very quick on their feet at processing things, and so they can just, um, they hear a, a concept once and they can just pick it up like that. Others, um, they may need to be exposed to it more times, but then they have amazing memories. And just once they learn something, they never forget it. So giftedness can just be this giant universe of different traits. It's not something like, oh, they're all wonderfully smart. We teach them all exactly the same way. <laughs> the students right. Are so so what crazy. you're saying essentially <laughs> is uh, that You know, even though there may be a tendency to put people into categories, that may not be realistic. Uh, That, in fact, every student's different. And that's certainly, you know, what I've found uh, to be the case. There are certainly similarities, but every student um, is an individual. And so it's important to, you know, recognize that and, and treat them as such. Now, under the broad category of learning differences, we have a, a few different uh, subcategories we wanted to talk about. The first one that we have written down here is executive function. And I have to tell you that before today, I'd never heard of that. Um, so I'm going to be learning a lot. Okay. But what is executive function? So executive function, um, so again, all of these definitions I'm giving are more sort of um, from the trenches definitions rather than the uh, perfect academic uh, definition. So students with executive function problems often have problems sort of bringing the big picture together. They have a hard time um, keeping track of things, uh, integrating a variety of ideas. Um, Some people joke that, well, and, well, some people, it's just something where it's a very common thing where you have to just learn systems. You have to learn how to put things together. And so a lot of kids just really struggle with this. And so there's a variety of, I mean, all students have to learn how to work with executive function, but um, some students just have a much bigger problem with that related to um, the what you would expect from a person of their age and development. And so So, that that's something that could present real problems in learning Latin. So for instance, I mean, clearly learning how to translate a sentence uh, requires bringing a lot of things together all at once, a lot. I mean, I know because I wrote out uh, 
the steps for translating a Latin sentence, mm -hmm. and it, it was very long. Yeah, when you well, actually, which you can find in the Gray Fox archives, by the way. Right, exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly, we've got it in the Gray Fox archives. But it, it it wasn't until I actually wrote it out that it became clear to me how many individual steps are involved, and that was, you know, what I wrote out was one way of doing it. Uh, but clearly, there are multiple ways of dealing with uh, that task translating a Latin sentence, yeah. but somebody with executive function, I imagine, would often have an extremely hard time um, dealing with that. I mean, what would you yeah. say, Lydia? So I'd say, so with, if somebody has an executive function disorder, then he or she might have a hard time with the translating a sentence because there's so many different things you have to integrate and work to, you bring together. But some students with executive function, they can even just sort of have problems getting even to the first step where it's they're having problems paying attention they're having problems keeping track of things where it's wait I need a pencil where it's yes that you have a problem remembering okay you need to have your you need to have a pencil every day and so just there can be just sort of it's not just you have a problem with the sentence. It's you have a problem even sort of getting, uh, approaching the sentence. Yeah, that was going to be a question I had. Yeah. How, de how detailed is that term when you talk about executive function? And, and you're basically answering it. So I was going to say, is it only related to the, the inner workings of the language? Or are we going even beyond that and talking about the entire process? So um, I would say, and again, not a technical um definition, but just these are just sort of the, a lot of executive function problems can be a sort of the skills that you need to have just to get you to your desk prepared and ready to learn. And so just, you may have problems even just getting there, making sure you're in the right mind space to learn that you've got all of the things that you uh, need. And then you've got a problem just sort of putting together, wait, I need to have the vocabulary. I need to have the grammar. I've got all of this stuff that I have to do. To, and I need to be sitting upright and paying attention to the teacher. And so just um, it's a very um, just that general broadness of it can just cover a lot of different issues and just it can be something that just comes up disrupting students in so many different places and just makes it so tough for them. Right. And, and, and I think actually this is the reason I wrote out steps for translating a Latin sentence mm -hmm. was because there were students who just could not handle it without having that in front of them. Now, eventually yeah. they got past that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the early stages, it was the only way for them to deal with it. They just could not remember what to do at every stage. They could not remember. But if they were given a series of steps and they could look at it every time, mm -hmm. then they could do it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. A lot of, and so just a lot of people who have had executive function problems in the past, it's just that they can rely on routines and checklists, either sort of an internal checklist, like remembering, okay, I need to make sure I've got my glasses, I need to have my wallet, I need to have my keys. Or it might even be a, um, or there might be an external checklist, like, okay, look for the verb, and so on and so forth. And so just those can be just be once you, a lot of students, once they've got those checklists and those tools, then they can really thrive. It's just sort of, it, they don't always come naturally to a lot of students. And so just if you can't really, if you're just having problems concentrating on the teacher, then you're not going to have, you're not going to have a really hard time learning what the teacher's saying. Right. Okay. Right. So uh, yeah. uh, let's sorry, talk. Costas, go on. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say, let's talk about the next thing on our list then. Absolutely. It's, that's a nice you read segue, my mind. I think. <laughs> As tends to happen quite often. Um, anyhow, uh, processing disorders. Uh, Lydia, talk to us a little bit about these, uh, specifically maybe auditory processing of information. Okay. So I ran into a lot of students with auditory processing uh, issues where it would be a lot of them would have problems sort of acting quickly on uh, things that they had to take in um, auditorially. So they would 
if they had the written direction so that they could come back to them and wait, oh, wait, did I skip step number three? Then they would do much better. But if it's they're having to listen, some of them had some problems with just um, having issues, even just sort of there are other sounds. And so just paying attention just to the teacher's voice as opposed to the jackhammer going farther down the block. And so just some of them, it would be just sort of that, differentiation there and just know I need to focus only on the teacher as opposed to, oh, wait, there are all of these sounds. How do I choose which one? Others, it was just they needed to go back and um, find a specific piece of information because it was just, they just needed to be able to go and check in multiple times. So it's sort of like if you're the difference between watching a video on how to do something and reading the steps step by step with pictures that Mm -hmm. there are some things the video can explain much better. But if it's, wait a second, did I get, did I get step seven, right? You might have a better time with the written out instructions and the pictures. Well, so uh, students with these processing disorders will often have a tendency to to, to tune the teacher out, I guess might be a, a common way to put it. It, I, I don't like saying tuning the teacher out because that sounds like that it's seems too a, broad, well, doesn't it? Yeah, it, and it sounds more sort of a willful thing. And again, this is something where no, no two students that I taught had the same kinds of issues. And again, I'm just talking about the sort of the from the classroom definition. But it could be that students had a hard time sort of choosing any sound might distract them easily so there's oh uh, at one I had a lot of, I've had I keep getting classrooms where um, it looks out on the playground and so just all right even though we've got the windows closed we can hear the second graders out there playing because they're second graders and so some of the students with auditory processing uh, problems might have a hard time mentally filtering out the noise from the second graders and focusing on, on what the teachers say And so some of those students might do, if it's the same information, if they can have it in writing as well so that they can make sure they're following it along so they're not having to sort of make sure they're tuning in correctly. So I would try to give have, if it was a long and complicated set of instructions, I'd try to make sure I've got it visually as well as I'm telling them, okay, do X, Y, and Z. Or if for whatever reason I couldn't have it visually, then I'd really try to check in after every step and break it up into bit by bit. So it would be do this, then do that, then do this other thing, but instead just, all right, everybody, do this. Make sure everyone's done that. And then just do it step by step. Okay. So we have to take a short break now uh, for a minute long message. uh, And then we'll be right back. I'd like to speak for a moment about how you can help sustain the Gray Fox workshops. Gray Fox believes in giving back. We do charge students for tutoring and classes, but because we believe Latin is for everyone, not just the few, we also offer free professional development workshops for teachers so that we can keep on offering and expanding these opportunities. Please consider referring people who need tutoring or are interested in languages beyond your purview. If you have a student whose complicated schedule makes meeting in person with a tutor difficult, please consider referring him or her to Gray Fox. Because our tutors and teachers are located in multiple time zones and all tutoring is done online, there will always be a tutor available at the time you need. If your students are frustrated by tutoring from peers or college students who disappear as soon as midterms start, please consider referring them to Gray Fox. We have been in operation since 2008 employing several dozen elite tutors. We are reliable and always available. Okay, we're back. And uh, Lydia, you were Mm -hmm. talking about uh, processing disorders. uh, And uh, I think that one thing you were kind of alluding to was the need for teachers and classes to really cover both the oral and the visual Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, if you have a classroom full of students, if you're just uh, working orally, then it's going to be uh, very difficult, not just for some students, but probably most of the students Mm -hmm. 
to really learn as effectively as they can. And if you're just being visual, then the same thing is true. Um, yes. and, and I would, uh, I, I would say that, you know, we, we kind of talk about these categories and, um, students with, uh, individual, uh, learning differences, but we've all got our learning differences and, mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of degree. And no matter what, if you're teaching a classroom full of students, it doesn't matter if it is, uh, a specific class for students with learning differences or, uh, you know, a specific class for gifted students or whatever it is, you're going to be dealing with diversity in the yep. classroom. Some of the things that just really, really made me a much better teacher um, at the start of my career, I was doing a lot of tutoring of students who were having problems in their um, with their Latin classes and just sort of seeing ways to help these students because uh, a lot of them it would be because of this way that the information is presented, I'm having problems with this. And so just a lot of the time helping them learn skills that they needed to have to thrive and then just presenting information in a way that helped them comprehend and use it that just really made them thrive. And then um, one of my good friends said, was talking to me about um, the various um, uh, IEPs and other plans and so on for uh, saying what students with learning differences needed to thrive. And she was saying basically a lot of the things that students with learning differences thrive boils down to good teaching. Uh, there's the theory of universal design for learning where it's saying, look, if you are presenting, the, if you're doing these things that will help students with these learning differences, they're going to help everybody and that right. just making sure that if you make sure that the students with executive functioning disorders are able to concentrate better well you're probably going to make help students who are just sort of wiggly middle school students concentrate better too that just there is a wide spectrum of human behaviors and a lot of these things will help everybody on that spectrum of human behaviors, whether it's a diagnosable learning difference or if it's just, yeah, I have some trouble with this To Actually, I, I have made my own routine for processing a Latin sentence that I like better than yours. And here, I, I actually made photocopies to share with the class. So just a and lot of these strategies help everybody. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I think it's important to note that we're not suggesting that good teaching is simply a panacea for everything here. Yeah. But oh, yeah. No, it's, it's a, definitely not. Yeah. It's a but, logical yeah. thing that can be applied yeah, uh, to all situations. Well, I, I, just I, I would say that when we talk about good teaching, we're, we're in large part talking about empathy and adaptability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so... The issue I think a lot of teachers have is that they were taught a certain way, and so they end up just teaching that way. Um, and the thing is, that may not be the ideal way to teach. In fact, it it almost certainly isn't. I mean, we can we can always do better uh, with uh, what we're doing. And my hope always is that teachers will be open to change. Uh, will be open to uh, adapting to students, will not get stuck in ruts. But I know a lot of teachers get stuck in ruts. Yes. Um, but that's not something <clears throat> that uh, a teacher who's dealing with uh, students who are either gifted or have you know, more extreme learning differences can do. Uh, that teacher has to be empathetic and that teacher has to adapt and that teacher has to learn. But uh, we had one more mm -hmm. we wanted to talk about, and that was ADHD. Yes. And, and I have a question, first of all. Yes. What's the difference between uh, ADD and ADHD? Well, um, the easy answer to your question is the H stands for hyperactivity. And so you might say if you have ADD, you don't have the hyperactivity component. Um, 
then it starts getting into uh, various types of ADD or ADHD with inattentive versus hyperactive. It's a very, very complicated system of things. Back in the 80s, I was actually diagnosed with ADD and told, no, it's not ADHD. But now it seems that um, the term ADHD is generally broadened to include all type all of these types um mm-hmm. i have noticed so, that yeah yeah it's something where it's uh well do you are you going for the words are you going for well in 1989 this was what it meant versus in 2017 this is what it meant so it's um it's something where i like sort of okay fancy footwork look over there okay now let's get back to talking about the practical parts of dealing with this so mm. well yeah so I mean, I guess, I guess that's my next question. Mm -hmm. What, what are the issues uh, students with ADHD have and how does one deal with those issues? Well, um, so not every student with ADD or ADHD is the same. Um, I mean, I was, I've, my experience was very different from some of the students that I've taught and just did something where it's sort of like um, every head cold people have isn't the same. You can have, it's, you say that word, you describe, you know, the kind of things people are describing, but each person's experience can be very different. So um, one thing that uh, people, when people talk about ADD or ADHD, they tend to talk about the distractibility or um, the um, inattentiveness. But uh, it also has the flip side of hyper-focus on things often. So a student with um, ADHD may be just passionate about something like, say, uh, Star Wars novelizations or um, be making up his own language to describe things or just other things like that where it's, you will, this student is just a boundless well of all of this information and these cool things and just uh, she will talk your ear off about, well, you see, Splinter of the Mind's Eye as a novelization isn't in the same kind of universe and uh, continuity as Heir to the Empire, of course, but I don't want to go into that anymore because... You can see what one of my hyper focuses has. Right, been. absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so it's um, uh, talking about yourself there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but just so that hyper focus can be really great. Um, sometimes when I was in school or where and I've been prepping, it's just I oh I I actually used to have to set a timer for myself to remind uh, before I had kids to remind me you need to go home because I would sometimes just be sitting there and just oh this is awesome I'm going to have the best lesson plan ever on this and I look up oh it's 7 p.m. oh oh um my husband has been emailing me uh, where are you are you uh are you you're okay right and just, oh, yeah, I, I should have been home about three or four hours ago. But just I because I'd been so wrapped up in I'm going to make this perfect lesson plan because I've got this great idea. And so you sometimes with students who have ADHD have just sort of, I'm going to learn every single usage of the ablative or something like that. Mm. But then they might not be as attentive on other matters where you wish, could you just take some of your interest in uh, the ablative usage and just apply that to say the accusative, that would be really helpful or great. You sat down with a copy of Bennett and you memorized everything it had to say about the ablative. Wonderful. But now can you work on learning some basic vocabulary instead of just, uh, raising your hand to identify, uh, instrumental ablative, uh, which would be more helpful in class. So, uh, uh, you have some advice about um, approaches for teaching ADHD students. What what are those approaches? Some of them, um, if you've got um, checkpoints in your teaching, like that timer I mentioned, where it's you are checking in with people to make sure that they understand a concept. So that can help a student who might be hyper-focusing on the wrong thing, or it can help a student who tends to be very distractible, 
or it can help a student who doesn't have any of these differences but is just having a hard time understanding uh, a concept. So it's if you have these check-ins, then, okay, I know the class as a whole understands this, this one kid needs more um, reinforcement on it, and then you can make useful decisions about how you're going to use class time. So that can help with that hyper-focus versus inattention part. Um, the hyperactivity section, that can, if sometimes if you just have ways that students can get up and move around and sort of burn some of their excess energy, that can be good for students who are diagnosed with ADHD, or it can be good with students who are, well, who are typical nine-year-olds or typical middle schoolers who just can't sit still for six and a half hours all day. And so if you've got constructive ways a kid can move around the room then and just things that the kid can do instead of, I will sit here um, with my hands folded neatly in my lap, my eyes fixed upon my teacher, as I have been doing for many, many hours already today, then that can just help students really be able to process better. One of my favorite things I used to do is this, uh, well, um, one of my favorite things I used to do was um, taking my students to learn Roman formation marching on one of the nice days of spring. And so we'd all go out and I'd be giving them uh, uh, commands in Latin, which is a great way to review the imperative and some of the direction words and everything like that. But also it gets everybody up and outside and it's, we're learning Latin and we're doing something But we're not just sitting at our seats. It's sort of a, all right, I'm going to remember this because I'm having to act these out. And, oh, wait, I'll always remember the Latin word for left now because I turned right because I got them mixed up and I walked into one of my buddies. And so just sort of that always was one of the things my students love doing where it's you're taking your language, uh, the language you've learned, and you're applying it. You're getting to get up. You're going outside on one of the nice spring days and just getting to do something cool and different. And then um, we'd sometimes also just do smaller versions of that um, with uh, Caesar Says or things like that where you can just get up and get moving and then people and then the students can concentrate a little bit more after that okay so that um, i was going to say that brings up one other major point of contention here that we must talk about Uh, those who have auditory processing disorders uh, tend to be pushed maybe into uh, the latin language because it's not traditionally spoken and if they are pushed into latin then the spoken latin component is uh, non-existent Uh, so are we effectively just throwing up our hands and saying this has to be in all of these cases? Where, where do you come down on that? So it's something, well, um, like I keep, like keeping saying about teaching, there's a difference between teaching in Plato's Republic and Romulus's sewer to um, adapt right. what Cicero used to say, where it's, there are things that are beautiful as when you're talking about them in theory, but then when you've got a kid who is just very upset about the idea of language learning because of a really bad experience in um, a modern spoken focused language, then sometimes it's, all right, I want to get you, I'll meet you where you are. I want to get you, so it's not, I, I'm stupid, I can't learn languages because you can learn languages, but just sometimes it's, you're just terrified at the idea of speaking them. So I want to sort of build you back up and that, yes, eventually it would be great if you could be speaking it, but I got you as a junior in high school. And so, and you're a great kid, but I know you're not going to go on to study Latin in great detail in the future. So maybe you don't end up having the confidence to really seek out a spoken Latin experience. So like with most things... Yeah, early quality mm-hmm. instruction is key. Yeah, yeah and I, just yeah, because yeah, if it's the idea of speaking a language just gives you a cold sweat because maybe you had a teacher who was hired for her beautiful accent and idiomatic command as opposed to her skills as a teacher at bringing out the best in a struggling student, then it might just be 
if we if I come in and I focus on spoken Latin with you, you're going to shut down. You're not going to get anything out of this. But if I'm sort of, hey, look here, we'll we'll do a little spoken stuff. But it's we're reading it from the script, or it's you've got your sheet that has all of the names of the types of weather, and so you can just refer to it and just say it. And where I'm going to be really supportive and. Even if you're sort of panicking about it, it's oh wait, I read this one word and I know I can do that, and that well, so yes. mm-hmm. so so I just want to say that uh, I think there is a misperception about who the best language teachers are. Uh, I think that certainly if we're talking about modern languages, as you brought up, Costas, there is a tendency to prefer native speakers of the language. But those may not be the best teachers of that language. Uh, Obviously, they grew up speaking it. Um, They never had to learn it in the way the students are learning it. Uh, It can be very difficult for them to have that empathy that they need. Uh, My personal opinion is that the best teacher of a language is a non-native speaker who has become fluent in the language. Um, that in most cases they are the most effective. And that's not to say that native speakers of a language can't be effective. I mean, I think I'm getting pretty good at teaching English at this point. Although I'll tell you what, I have a harder time teaching English than I have teaching Latin. Um, And, you know, part of that is I just haven't done an enormous amount of it. Um, And I, I certainly have learned a lot from when I started for the first time. Uh, But I think there are some misperceptions here. And and there's no question that in America, unfortunately, there is a lack of respect for foreign language, whether we're talking about modern languages or ancient languages. And part and parcel of that is an enormous fear of foreign languages among Americans. So you talked about that fear, Lydia, students uh, having had a bad experience and being afraid of the language. That happens constantly in America. Yeah. Uh, now, that's not to say it doesn't happen in other countries, but it happens a lot here, probably more here, because we are such a um, monolingual society if i yeah. can put if i can put that prefix together with that word yeah. um, sorry well, uh, lydia go on yeah i'm i'm actually friends with a lot of um scientists and the european scientists most of them tend to they speak three or four languages fluently and so it's okay they're wait you're danish but you speak English entirely fluently, no one would guess it was not your first language. Or um, we were once at a party in Moscow where everyone had to give a toast in a different language. And just the wide variety that all of the European scientists had where it's, oh, wait, somebody gave a toast in Spanish? Oh, fine, I'll give a toast in Finnish then. Um, (laughs) Where it's just sort of, they considered it normal that even though I'm a scientist, I know languages. Whereas a lot of the American scientists would tend to be, no, I'm a math and science person. I'm not a language person. And I'd see that in my students as well, where it's just sort of a, I have this fear of the language. And so some of these students that I'd had who'd had those bad experiences in the past, they were more open to Latin because it was, wait, this is like a puzzle. This is like a math equation. I can see the pattern in this. If I see one word from a sentence, I can make predictions about how it fits in. Whereas if I see one word in French, I can't see how it fits in because it it could be a subject. It could be a direct object. Who knows? But Latin (laughs) from even one word, I can start making predictions. And so just for some of those students, it was just having this different way of presenting it and this different way of looking at it, just sort of they wouldn't be as scared because it's, well, I'm not going to be expected to ask for directions to the train station in Latin. And I can think about it more abstractly that this is a puzzle. I'm good at puzzles instead. This is a language. I'm awful at languages, you know, where it's, well, but you speak English, which you grew up speaking fluently and you, you learn, you learn this language. So you can learn other ones. I mean, uh, just to, just to, 
kind of um, put a cap on this. Yeah. Uh, we'll be we'll be wrapping up here soon. Mm-hmm. Um, but my general opinion is that there's far too much extremism amongst mm-hmm. language teachers, and this is the big issue. So. Um, frequently, I think students will have um, uh, negative experiences with modern languages because the the teachers tend to be extremists. They tend to be only focused on conversation. They never talk about grammar. They might talk about it a tiny bit, but they don't like to do it. Mm -hmm. And part of that is maybe they they were taught to do it that way. Partially, it may be that Maybe they don't understand grammar that well, um, mm-hmm. and so they like to avoid it. Um, on the other side, uh, with Latin teachers or un- other ancient language teachers, there continues to be this extremism in the direction of uh, no oral component at all with so many uh, teachers. And I think that that is really negative as well. I actually think both of these things are very negative. Mm-hmm. And that the correct path is the middle path, I guess I would say. Um, that it's very important to be doing both of these things, not to just uh, focus on one of them. Um, and I think that often, now of course, this isn't the case for any of us, but clearly there are students who might find Latin a little bit dull if it is taught in uh, just a a 100% grammar and translation sort of way. What I've noticed is that the students I've had, and and this is what I've heard from other teachers, it's it's a challenge for them because they're native English speakers. They're not used to speaking any other language at all, but they love the conversational aspect of their Latin uh, classes. That's when it really becomes fun. It's a challenge, but it's fun. Um, So, you know, I would say in the end that no matter what students you're teaching, uh, whether they be gifted students, whether they be students with learning differences or students who don't fit into either of those categories, the key is not to be too extreme in what you're doing, but to be flexible, to adapt to the students. Kostas, what do you think? Well, you and I have talked about this a lot, and even on some previous episodes, I know we've talked about this quite a bit. And flexibility and adaptability are the big keys uh, when you're teaching. And this fits Mm -hmm. in very nicely, of course, with what we've been talking about today, how important it is to be able to adapt to everyone, because you don't want to have this mindset that you can only work with certain people because you have one way of doing things. And that will never work. You have to be adaptable, uh, especially if you're teaching uh, Latin. Uh, for, that goes for any teacher, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, that's just something that's paramount to the profession. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and yeah. so um, I think that that's good for today. Lydia, thank you so much for joining, it, for joining us. I had a really great time. I had fun Come too. back and see us, please. Okay. <laughs> right. And uh, Costas, could you take us out? Yes. Okay. So, uh, and just to put a quick wrap on this, uh, as we said in the opener, we hope that today's show would be enlightening for our audience just as much as it was for us. And I think it was, we learned quite a bit here today and, uh, very thankful to our guest again, Lydia, thank you for being here and Andrew, okay. thank you as usual. Thank you. All right. And if you like what you heard today, please subscribe to our podcast and we'll be bringing you many more topics of interest in the coming weeks. Thank you everyone for listening to the Gray Fox Latin Teacher Podcast. 